On Sunday, August 30th, 2015, Wes Craven passed away in his home in California. This was shocking to me, and it's really not being treated as news. Filmmakers are celebrities, but unless you're really versed in film, I think most people when they go to see a movie, they don't really pay attention to who made the film. They're not like rock stars, so they don't get that kind of recognition, which is really sad because filmmakers, a lot of them, the big ones, have really long legacies of making great cinema and great movies and for those who don't know Wes Craven was the creator of Freddy Krueger of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise he directed the Scream movies and of course his earlier works The Hills Have Eyes and The Last House on the Left were really really important works and he really left an imprint on on cinema he was very important and he's actually one of my five favorite directors so that's why I'm doing this kind of little mini podcast just to kind of give my last thoughts on on the filmmaker because he really did leave an impression on my childhood and when it comes to horror movies which is one of my favorite genres of film he's absolutely my favorite horror director and I know a lot of people might you know bring up Alfred Hitchcock well of course I mean he was great as well there are a lot of great filmmakers for very different reasons I just thought when it came to movies Wes Craven was both really good at balancing narrative with really strong stories and characters and he was great at scaring the holy shit out of you so what i really want to talk about is what i consider the Wes craven trilogy and those are basically his first three films the last house on the left the hills have eyes and nightmare on elm street of course he did scream way later in the 90s and i'd like to say that he was responsible in the mid-90s for kind of resurrecting horror movies, the slasher genre most of all. And the Scream you know, Scream has its place in the history. And, and when it was just a trilogy, I don't think anyone had really done a solid horror trilogy like that before. My wife and I watched the series religiously. We haven't missed an episode yet. But that's, I just want to kind of stick with the classic Wes Craven. And those are also the three films. When I was in film school circa 2001-2002, all of us in the class had to pick out a director to pick and watch their films and kind of look at their directing style, and I chose Wes Craven because Nightmare on Elm Street really had left an impression on me. I got into those movies, into Freddy Krueger, at a very young age. I think I was seven or eight. It had to be the early 90s. It was actually, I think, right before Freddy's Dead came out. So 1990, 91 was when I was really starting to get into horror movies. And in 91... I was eight years old. I'm actually one of the few kids I know that actually got to see Wes Craven's New Nightmare in theaters in 1994. I was 11 when that movie came out. I was a little young to see Freddy's Dead. I was able to watch. The rule was I could watch whatever I wanted to at home. My parents didn't really censor me. They let me watch whatever I wanted to, but they didn't want me to go out in public and see those movies. They were afraid to take me to a theater to see like Freddy's Dead, which actually was one of the tamest ones in the series I think still to be 11 years old and to to be let into the theater to see that kind of a movie at that young of an age most people my age actually I think the first movie they saw in the theater was Freddy vs. Jason which was like the last canonical movie in the franchise but at 8 years old the reason and I've touched on this many times before but the reason why I got into horror movies it was just kind of a really cool thing to me to be able to watch more adult movies R rated movies that I knew a lot of kids in school at that age weren't allowed to watch so there was kind of a novelty of going to school and telling kids hey I saw this really sweet graphic gory horror movie and and tell them the details and they'd be like oh wow you're allowed to watch those movies and it was just kind of cool to be the kid that had that knowledge of of that adult world even today when you look at those movies some of them are a little more tame than like a movie you might see today I think those movies were intended for not not kids my age but definitely for teenage audience even though they were R-rated movies they were going for you know the 14 15 year old crowd too I mean Nightmare on Elm Street 4 had an MTV commercial in it and everything but anyway back to the original Nightmare on Elm Street when I was a kid I don't think I appreciated the original Nightmare on Elm Street when it first came out I actually had seen 
Freddy's Revenge was the first one I saw. I just happened to own a really old copy of it on VHS. The ones I grew up with were actually 2 and 5, The Dream Child. And those two, incidentally, are considered kind of the the black sheep in the series. But when you when I first sat down to watch the original, it had I understood it was the original, but it had a very kind of late 1970s dreamy kind of carry style to it in compared to the other ones. The other one starting with really Freddy's Revenge, Freddy's Revenge when you look at it looks like the pinnacle 80s horror movie. Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one being in 1984, just looks like it was shot maybe 5 years earlier. You know, because it's the first one, it's very fresh. The characters are reacting to it for the very first time. It's always weird to come into a franchise later and then go back and see the original movies. Very much like James Bond, when you maybe watch like the, the Pierce Brosnan movies, let's say a lot of people my age were introduced to him with those films. Then you go back and watch the Sean Connery films. Very different style. That's kind of similar to how this was. Over the years, I've appreciated it, and I, I always love those older 70s, 80s, mo- mostly in the 70s. Horror movies at that point were very experimental, and you saw, like, Tobe Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, another Wes Craven film, Hills Have Eyes, of course, Last House on the Left. Even the original Friday the 13th had these very kind of gritty documentary-style feels to them. They felt r- real. They felt like you were sitting there not even watching a movie. As a matter of fact, for his first film, The Last House on the Left, the tagline for that movie in the trailers is, it's only a movie, and they repeat that over and over again. Because sometimes you have to be reminded, that's how visceral that film is. So Freddy Krueger was an influence on me, and to a lot of kids. A lot of kids my age knew who Freddy was. A lot of us were actually probably introduced to Freddy with the Nintendo video game. From there, we I just you know got into the, the movies, and and now that Wes Craven is gone, it's even more of an insult I think when you look at that 2010 remake, and I'm not even one of those guys that are like oh that was a piece of shit and it was forgettable. It it was a movie that shouldn't have been made, and it was a disappointing film when you compare it to through to the original. Of course, a lot of remakes are disappointing. They're they're definitely inferior to the original, but the fact that they didn't even like approach Wes Craven for his approval or anything like that is just really an insult. You look at that original film, I was actually just watching it like five minutes before I started recording this, I was watching part of it, and it's just so visceral, the stuff they were able to pull off in 1983 or 1984 with Tina being dragged down the hallway in that plastic bag and spewing out those centipedes, and the scene, Tina gets it really bad in that movie, the scene where she's getting tossed around in that bedroom, and you have the spinning bedroom set piece that has her spinning around on the walls. I mean, it's just really creative, freaky stuff. And it was, it's probably still is the most innovative kind of horror movie. The fact that this killer gets you in your dreams, and it's just, when you look at something like Jaws or Friday the 13th, that are location specific like yeah Jaws made people afraid to go into the ocean and Friday the 13th made it harder for people to go camping but with a dream and they've touched on this in the series where are you going to go to escape this guy he gets you in your dream so there really is no way to get you get away from him and that's the other thing I really like about that first movie that you kind of miss with the other ones the first Nightmare on Elm Street had that really important hook where Nancy finds out for the first time that you can actually pull things out of your dream into reality, and that's how you kill them. And I thought that was ingenious, and it was such just a great piece of, of marketing for that movie, the hook of that movie, that a lot of horror movies don't have, because usually it's just some psychopathic killer that plays mind games with his prey, or today's horror movies are just so much different than they used to be. The cast was great. Wes Craven was one of those guys that I would have loved to have met in person. Again, he's one of my favorite five filmmakers. Wes Craven, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, of course, Kevin Smith, Robert Zemeckis. Those those are the five for very different reasons. They all have very different varying levels of talent, but for different reasons, those five resonate with me. Wes Craven also in 2007 was a guest director on the reality show On The Lot. For those who don't know, On The Lot was a reality show I believe Steven Spielberg produced it, and the winner of the reality sh- of this reality show was that they would get a $1 million production deal with DreamWorks and actually get to work 
in the offices at DreamWorks. It was only on for one season. I believe the ratings just weren't strong enough for it to get another season, which is really a shame because that's the only reality show I've ever watched. It was intriguing because every week the filmmakers on the show had to make a short film, a genre-specific short film, and Wes Craven was on the, of course, the Horror Week episode. And his advice was very simple, make it scary. And no one really did that better than Wes Craven. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should cover about the original Nightmare on Elm Street. It's just a great flick. If you haven't seen the original, you have to see it. Robert England as Freddy Krueger. It's so funny now, too. The original person that was supposed to play Freddy was David Werner. And David Werner was, he was in a lot of movies He usually doesn't play main characters. He usually plays these kind of side characters in the background. He was in an 80s movie, My Best Friend is a Vampire. He had a very memorable part in that. Of course, he was the professor in Ninja Turtles 2. He's done quite a few things. Very great actor. He was supposed to be the original Freddy Krueger. Freddy Krueger was supposed to be an older villain in in his 50s or maybe even 60s. And Robert England at the time was, I think, in his mid 20s. He could have even been in his early 30s. But he was just too young for the part. But he came in, and something about the way he presented himself to Wes landed him the part of Freddy Krueger. And now it's funny to think that Robert England is probably the right age, the age that originally was right for the character, it would be cool to kind of see him go back into the character. And I heard there's talks to put him in there. It's kind of crazy to think that Wes Craven is gone now, so the the possibility of him having any input into another Nightmare film, whether it be a remake or a sequel or whatever, it's, it's really kind of hard to swallow. Because this was very sudden. I know somebody personally who worked with Wes on Scream 4 when he was filming in Michigan, and she didn't even know that he'd passed away until I told her, you know. So it really wasn't presented as this big news story. I really, it, I think, and I respect the man's privacy, don't get me wrong. But I just really think it should have been a bigger piece than what it was. And it went kind of, he passed kind of gracefully, I think. it. You know, it was very quiet. Very little coverage about it. Nightmare on Elm Street, there's not enough good things I can say about it. It's almost a perfect horror movie in every way. The cast, I love Heather Langenkamp as Nancy in the in the movie. John Saxon plays her father, who's also kind of on his way to being a drunk. Johnny Depp made his acting debut in this movie, I believe. So you have to check it out. If it's on Netflix, if you have a chance to rent it, download it, buy it on Blu-ray. You can actually buy the whole Nightmare Collection on DVD for fairly cheap at any store, really. I recommend that first movie. The other two that I watched and I got into later on, the first one is actually one of my favorite horror films, and it's a very important film, even though it gets looked at in a very negative light, is Last House on the Left. It came out in 1972. Wes Craven directed, produced by Sean Cunningham, which actually helped him get a job as a director on Friday the 13th years later. This is an important film because it is one of the scariest, most disturbing horror films I've ever seen. It is graphic, but not it's not saw levels of graphic. It's not gratuitous, but it shows you enough to be disturbing. It's a very haunting film. It's about these two girls... They're going out. It's one of their birthdays, so they go out on the town. They're looking to score some dope, and they happen to hook up with these guys that are offering them said drugs, not knowing that this group of people that they've hooked up with are escaped criminals. They're murderers and rapists. They've committed crimes of the highest order. They hook up with these two girls, and of course, They kidnap them, they take them deep into the woods, they torture them, rape them, force them to do sexual things on each other, and then kill them. And then there is a payoff at the end of the movie. I don't want to spoil the movie, but that's the main gist of it. There was a remake of it. Again, I don't believe Wes had much input into the remake. I would not recommend seeing the remake just because it just didn't need to be made. And this is a movie that had... The reason why it's effective is because it was shot as if it were a real event. I've got a daughter, a five-year-old daughter. So watching this movie now, absolutely um, has more impact now than it did when I first watched it when I was 18. It's a very gritty-looking film. It, It feels like one of the killers had a camera the whole time and was just documenting 
them doing these things to this gir- to these girls. That's how realistic it is. It's not an enjoyable film. It's it's a very tough film to sit through until the last act, which again I won't spoil. But it's very satisfying having seen these these villains what they've done, and that's why I didn't like the original. The orig- original kind of softened the blow a little bit. This one takes no prisoners. They show you a lot of what these killers do. It's very disturbing. A lot of it you'll want to probably turn away and shut your eyes. It's that gruesome. Not again, not because it's violent, but it's hard to watch. And I think what's really hard to swallow about this movie is it sheds light on something that probably, unfortunately, happens a lot in America. Unfortunately, this movie just shows that there's a lot of sick, twisted people out there. And that's what's disturbing about this. There's nothing that these characters do that someone wouldn't be able to do in real life. You hear about these violent crimes all the time on like crime shows and the news and everything. So it they give you just enough to be realistic. It's the kind of stuff that really gives you nightmares. I mean, and, and don't get me wrong, this movie is considered by many to be one of the worst films ever made because it's so gritty and because the acting it's not really acting it's it's people acting like they're not acting they they look like real people and there's a cheese factor to it there are some kind of cheesy it's a very 70s movie and it was early 70s so it definitely hasn't aged well on that front but you watch it today it's it's almost more effective because it's like you're picking up a piece of time like almost like Blair Witch if Blair Witch had been done well It's like you just picked up, you found this random footage of stuff that you really shouldn't be seeing. It's like you're a voyeur and you you can't take your eyes away from it. But it's just shocking and disturbing. And the one other thing I'll have to say about this film, don't see it with a date. I think I've touched upon this before. Unless you're very comfortable with the person you're with. I actually ended up taking a date when I was 18, 19 to see this movie at home because I was doing it for a Clash project, but she was with me, so we popped it in, and I actually had to apologize to her at the end because it was that visceral. The rape scene especially, which they do in the remake, and of course, it, it just... I'm not saying that the rape scene needs to be... It's not an enjoyable scene, but there's just a right way and a wrong way to do it, and I respect that kind of a scene in the original because they built the, the main villain Krug who's like the leader of the of these escaped convicts he's gotten to a point that when the scene happens in the movie he's presented as such an unlikable douchebag and a really scary villain almost more so than Freddy Krueger because this guy you could see how psychopaths could be like this guy so they've built up this character so the next logical step would be for the rape this rape scene to happen which they don't really do successfully in the remake so that's enough about that it is a very disturbing uncomfortable movie very important film though and one of my favorites for that reason a horror movie is supposed to be scary when a movie gets under your skin like that that's how you know you're effective it doesn't have to necessarily be popular or likable not all horror movies are fun although i think most of them should be a little bit fun. You go to a movies to to be entertained. This is the rare exception where it's just pure scary the whole way through. The last one I want to talk about is kind of a... I don't want to say lighter because it is a very intense film. It's the one film my wife will not watch. This one, Wes Craven, was actually very heavily involved in the remake. And I would actually suggest watching the remake as well as the original because both are very well done. They're They're both... Almost scene for scene, the same thing. Visually, I think the, the the remake does some things right, though, surprisingly. But again, Wes Craven, I think, wrote the script. He might have even produced it. But The Hills Have Eyes, which sounds like an alternate title for a Mario game. If you play the old Mario games, the hills in those games have eyes. The fucking clouds in those games have eyes. But anyway, The Hills Have Eyes is basically about this family of mutants off in the mountains. They got left behind during the uh, nuclear test blasting that happened, you know, during that era in the 60s. They got left behind because they refused to move. So now there are these deformed mutants and they're cannibals. There's this family that's just headed through the desert 
I forget where it takes place, but they're headed through the desert. I want to say somewhere in California, or they're at least headed to California. They get trapped in the desert, and these cannibals, one by one, pick this family off. And it's really brutal because there's a married couple, a newlywed couple with a newborn baby, and there's no protection in this film. Bad shit happens to everybody. I believe there is a rape scene in this movie, too. Maybe not as visceral, but yeah, I, I, it is very visceral. I mean, rape scenes are never pleasant, but depending on the situation, what's going on, sometimes they stick with you more because of the situation. And again, I won't spoil anything, but again, it's got a very documentary style, although it's, it's more of a cinematic style than, say, Last House on the Left. It's right there in between Last House and Nightmare, where it's just fictional enough to make you believe. I mean, the mutants, for God's sakes, are really over the top and really a joy to watch, but then when the shit hits the fan, then it becomes really intense. And again, really scary. And that's maybe that's why Wes Craven for so many years was kind of under the radar, was because of movies like that. Just really, three really interesting films. You know, every everybody, babies, dogs. I mean, it's not a very happy film, but it's very intense, very scary. And there are actually lighter moments in that film. Again, the, the villains do kind of get their comeuppance at the end. I won't spoil it. It stuck with me for some reason. So those are the three films that I felt really defined as work. I would recommend any of them. Again, Last House, be prepared. It, it's very disturbing. But Nightmare on Elm Street, for sure, Hills of Eyes, I would say, kind of view at your own discretion, if you've got a strong stomach especially, but very well-made film, very genre-defining film for Wes Craven. And that's really all I have to say. I mean, it's it's very, I'm very sad that he's gone. To me, it's, it's like akin to if someone you like, like a rock star, you really enjoyed, passed away suddenly. You know, and they would probably get more recognition because rock stars, of course, are out in the public light. Filmmakers, not always so. And I just wanted to put this little podcast together because this man, this filmmaker, meant so much to me. And he, like I said, he left a a really big impression on filmmaking. He did other films, too. I'm aware he directed People Under the Stairs, which is another kind of weird horror movie. He also was a writer. He wrote a book called The Fountain Society which is actually more of a sci-fi drama than horror. It's very interesting. It deals with cloning minds and body swaps. It's very interesting. I would recommend that. Good read. He also directed a film with Meryl Streep that I believe she won, I want to say, an Oscar for or at least an Oscar nomination for in the 90s, I believe. So check that out as well. He was the master of contemporary horror films, the father of Freddy Krueger, and I just wanted to put it out there that he will be missed. We have lost a very fine filmmaking talent.